afternoon, so we'll get started with our next session here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to give a quick bio, and then we're going to have a actually a presentation coming from Lee Schneider. Um, I want to first off thank Lee for coming back to Blacksburg. He was actually a participant in our 2019 summit. Is that right? All right. Good deal. Well, um, a quick bio for Lee. He is a financial services and technology lawyer with extensive expertise in blockchain. He co-hosts the Appetite for Dis Eruption podcast with Troy Paredes and is a contributing editor to the Chambers and Partners FinTech Practice Guide. He co-founded the Global Blockchain Convergence and is an act and is active with a number of organizations. Uh, Lee serves as a general counsel for Ava Labs and is the father of two wonderful college students and enjoys learning, hearing about Japanese art history from his wife. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lee for a presentation about CBDCs. And a quick reminder for everybody to drop your questions uh, into the chat, and I'll be able to get to those with about you know 20 minutes or so at the end of his presentation. All right, Lee, take her away. I think you're on mute, actually. Ah, thank you. You'd think after uh, so many years of COVID and Zoom, I would have figured all the stuff out at this point, but apologies for that. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Jim, and thank you for inviting me to participate once again. Uh, in 2019, when I participated, I was the general counsel at Block One, and so lots of ties to Blacksburg, and I spent a lot of time at in Blacksburg and at Virginia Tech. Um, I since have moved on to become the general counsel of Ava Labs, and now I'm doing uh, a lot of the same work and a lot of different work as well. As, uh, as Tom was saying, the blockchain space is moving so quickly and there are so many different things to do that uh, I find myself saying yes to all kinds of interesting things, even though I don't have time to do them. So anyway, I have been asked to talk a little bit about central bank digital currencies. I thought I would throw in some information about stable coins as well. I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you all can see it. Let me switch this to slideshow. How are we looking over here? Does it look good? Looks great. Awesome. So a brief primer on central bank digital currencies and stable coins. Uh, Going to talk a little bit about lots of different things related to both topics. If anybody would like a copy of the presentation, uh, feel free to reach out to the organizers and they'll get a copy from me. I'm happy to share it. Um, it's a document that I regularly update and uh, talk about, uh, and there's always lots of interesting things going on in this space. So what is a central bank digital currency? I took a bunch of def definitions from a bunch of different places. Uh, we keep seeing more and more consultation papers and reports on central bank digital currencies. And so we keep seeing more and more definitions of what a CBDC is. And I think it's a, it's a world where there is finally coming to some consensus about it. Um, going to distinguish central bank digital currencies from stable coins. Stable coins are not government issued money, even though they might be linked to fiat currency. And stable coins are digital assets that seek to reduce their price volatility against other assets. That is to say, they're trying to have a nominal face value that refers to another asset. So that could be a fiat currency, but it also could be physical commodities or real estate or security or a basket of assets, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about central bank digital currencies, we are typically talking about a fiat currency, government issued money. When we talk about stable coins, we can be talking about a digital asset that is linked to fiat money, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the only thing that it's linked to, or indeed, um, it could be a basket of other things. Wanted to review some of what I think are the major considerations for design and implementation of central bank digital currencies. The first is the fiat currency question. Now, 
as a general matter, there's no reason that you have to have a central bank digital currency be fiat money. In fact, most of the quote unquote fiat money that floats around in the world these days is actually created by banks and not by the uh, the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank or the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Rather, that money is created through bank deposits and uh, fractional reserve banking, which is a topic we can talk about another day and probably something that's worth everybody trying to understand at least a little bit so that they can see all the different ways in which money is actually created. So there's no objective reason why a central bank digital currency needs to be part of the country's fiat currency. And you could see a, a stable coin that is linked to the fiat currency and sanctioned by the central bank. Um, in, and, and that could take the place of uh, the CBDC. Now, for the most part, what's being discussed in the various reports that I alluded to before is actually the CBDC being one of the forms of fiat currency for the country. In other words, issued by the central bank rather than issued by individual banks or the banking system as a whole or some other providers. The next question, the next design consideration is privacy. Will the central bank digital currency ensure privacy for its users to the same extent that physical cash does? And how can we design a central bank digital currency that will accomplish that? One of the beautiful things about cash is I can spend it and nobody is asking me who I am when I spend the physical cash. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. If I try to spend large sums of physical cash, then I'm probably going to get asked who I am and have to do some identity checks. But most of my day-to-day -day grocery shopping, most of my day-to-day -day purchases, when I go buy a slice of pizza for lunch a little bit later, um, when I eat at other restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, nobody's asking for my identity. They don't care who I am. They just care that the cash is actually not counterfeit, right? And so can we duplicate that through technological means in a central bank digital currency? The answer is there are lots of people who are working on that problem. And so, yes, um, but this is a design and implementation choice that will be made by central banks. And one of the countervailing issues that has been identified is the need to stop or deter, deter money laundering and other criminal activity with a CBDC. And so that's where the rubber is going to meet the road here and we'll have a little bit of tension in design and implementation for central bank digital currencies. The next design and implementation factor is trust. Does the CBDC system and platform achieve trust through transparency and accountability uh, such that everybody's willing to use it? One of the things about physical cash is that we all trust that it is real and usable and that we'll be able to pay for things with that physical cash. We need to establish the same level of trust for a central bank digital currency. And as with most new technologies, it's going to take people a while to get used to that. It's going to take people a while to make sure that they trust the central bank digital currency. And so what kinds of features can we build into the system and the platform so that there is appropriate levels of transparency and accountability of key stakeholders, the kinds of uh, public disclosure of design and architecture, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that the central bank digital currency is trustworthy. And last but not least, I wanted to talk about interoperability and programmability as design considerations. So what do I mean by programmability? Programmability means that anybody can create 
other means of using the central bank digital currency on a variety of platforms in the same way that cash is interoperable. So I can go take cash into any store and uh, use it to make payments. Um, I can take my credit card online and use it to make payments. We want to have that same level of interoperability, regardless of what platforms are involved, so that a central bank digital currency can be used easily and effectively to pay for things. And the programmability is a, a piece of that. So can you program your money to do what you want it to do? So for example, uh, when I get paid every uh, two weeks, a portion of my paycheck goes into my 401k. That is a way of programming things so that it happens automatically. There's a bunch of computer systems that talk to each other to make sure that a portion of my paycheck gets to where it's headed. And we want to be able to make sure that a CBDC can be programmable in that way too. If I want to pay my mortgage on the same day every month, I should be able to program my CBDC to make that happen the same way I can do that with my bank today to make regular payments of my bills. When people talk about central bank digital currencies, they talk about two flavors. One is a wholesale CBDC and the other one is a retail CBDC. So retail refers to precisely a lot of the examples that I've been giving, which are Lee goes and buys a slice of pizza, Lee takes his wife out to dinner, Lee goes to the grocery store and does shopping, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is an individual on a retail level interacting with merchants and vendors to do a variety of things. Wholesale CBDC is between banks, making sure that the banking system can use the central bank digital currency to effect payments between financial institutions so that um, it replaces the way, excuse me, that payments take place now between large financial in institutions. And even if it doesn't completely replace how that's done, it is a supplemental method by which those payments can be made. The case for central bank digital currencies, uh, the New York Fed at the end of last year published a blog post that made the case for central bank digital currencies. Here are the items that they listed there um, to, as to why CBDCs are a good idea. You know, one of the issues that we see in the US compared to other jurisdictions is the ease and promptness of making payments. Actually, the US is a bit behind many other jurisdictions around the world in how easy it is to make um, payments on a real time basis. Most payments in the US settle in three to five days after the payment has been made, as opposed to Europe, for example, or many countries in Africa, for example, where the settlement of payments occurs more or less in real time. Uh, because look, at the end of the day, we're just talking about updating centralized computers to show the changes in the payments. Now, there can be benefits to having slower payments, um, and I, I don't want to say that there are no benefits there, but the key uh, for reducing risk associated with payments is to make those payments as prompt as possible or as real time as possible. And so in the US uh, and other jurisdictions as well, but let's focus on the US in particular, um, there definitely needs to be upgrades to the payment system. And you'll see this discussed a lot in the various releases on central bank digital currencies. In fact, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, gave a speech last week and identified payments as uh, an area where the U.S. needs to, to get better as well. 
Uh, let's talk briefly about central bank digital currencies and national security. There are definitely national security issues here, particularly um, from a cybersecurity standpoint and uh, from how monetary policy gets made, um, creating and furthering economic and financial inclusion is also a, a major concern. And then assisting government agencies in the delivery of services to, to their constituents. So we see all of these as desirable characteristics in a central bank digital currency world, particularly one where these transfers can happen directly from the government as opposed to through the banking system, and therefore lessening the delays in which a lot of these payments can, be, can, can occur. Uh, I am definitely not an expert on monetary policy. I don't pretend to be an economist or know that much about this stuff, but there are a lot of questions about how a, the introduction of a central bank digital currency might impact uh, the way the Fed or some other central bank affects monetary policy. Monetary policy is basically the injection of uh, of money from the central bank into the economy or taking money out of the economy by the central bank through a variety of means, including setting interest rates. So um, how does that, how does it get affected? I list a bunch of the factors here on this slide, um, and these are very important considerations, but ones that are, are way above my, my simple knowledge of these issues. We already talked a little bit about central bank digital currencies and payments infrastructure, some of the limitations in the US on its payments infrastructure, and how a central bank digital currency might in, improve the, some of those limitations. Um, there is also the question of how the overall banking system would function if there's a central bank digital currency in place. Would people have accounts directly with the central bank? Would the banking system continue to intermediate those between the central bank and uh, account holders? How will all of that work and how will it impact payments? These are all design considerations and, and issues that need to be taken into account when we're thinking about a central bank digital currency. And last but not least, uh, thinking a little bit about systemic risk. Uh, systemic risk is a concept that really grew out of the 2008 financial crisis, and uh, it thinks about how different elements of the financial system, if they all had bad impacts at the same time, might cause risk to the financial system as a whole. Will a central bank digital currency smooth out some of those risks, make sure that there is uh, more certainty around payments and the holding of money, et cetera, et cetera? These are all questions that um, are also present in the central bank digital currency discussions. So let's talk about stable coins for a little bit. Uh, here's overall the definition that I use for stable coins. Remember, we talked about this at the beginning of the presentation, contrasting stable coins and central bank digital currencies. Uh, stable coins, as I said, refers to a larger class of things than just fiat currency linked stable coins although the fiat currency linked stable coins are the most popular ones right now. They sort of break into three categories. One category is stable coins that are actually backed one for one with fiat currency. Another category is algorithmic stable coins that use a variety of uh, algorithms and mathematical techniques to try to achieve price stability against fiat currency. And then the last one is stable coins that are backed by other crypto assets. So for example, UST, the stable coin on the Luna blockchain is backed by a combination of Luna tokens, 
Bitcoin and Avox tokens, the native token on the Avalanche public blockchain. Um, the uh, most popular stable coin that's backed by digital assets is DAI from MakerDAO. Uh, that utilizes primarily ETH, Ether as the backing mechanism, but it does permit other uh, crypto assets to be part of the backing of DAI and uh, trying to maintain stability in that way. So um, lots of different things to think about in the stablecoin world. One of the benefits of a central bank digital currency, as the central bankers constantly are reiterating, is that there is a level of trust in fiat currencies, particularly major fiat currencies like the dollar, the pound, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc and, and several other major currencies. Um, there is a level of trust already built in there. There is the fact that they are backed by the central bank and the governments of those jurisdictions that gives a level of trust. With stable coins, that is not so much there. And so thinking about whether the one for one backing with fiat currency, whether the collateralization through crypto assets, or whether the algorithmic mechanisms that achieve stability are sufficient if there is a crisis or some, some big problem, uh, those are important things to think about with regard to stable coins. Stable against what? We've already talked about this. Uh, you know, some of this is stable against fiat currencies. Some of this uh, could be stability against other commodities uh, or indices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, most people are talking about stable coins and they're talking about stable against fiat currencies, primarily, fr frankly, almost exclusively US dollars. Um, although there is some move for stable coins with the euro and the pound and a few other currencies. Um, so that's, this is a question that you need to be asking yourself, stable against what? Um, how are stable coins created? Excuse me, there can be a number of different ways that they are created. As I said, with central bank digital currencies, we're looking at the central bank of a country as the creator of the stable coins. Um, if you're, uh, I'm sorry, as the creator of the central bank digital currency, if you're creating a stable coin, um, you know, you would be probably considered the issuer of that stable coin. Now, if you are not creating it entirely on chain, that is to say, there is some centralized party like uh, Tether, like USDC, um, then you're worried about who the issuer is. How do you know you can trust the issuer? How do you know that the backing is there? All of those kinds of things that we read about in the press about stable coins that we read about in the president's working group report when they talked about stable coins uh, in the president's executive order, et cetera. Uh, when things are created on chain, it's a little bit different. There is a lot of transparency. For example, the, um, the stable coins that are collateralized by crypto assets, everything's done on chain. You can audit the smart contract. You can see the level of collateralization that's in place. You can watch the smart contract functioning for the creation or the destruction of the stable coin as collateral is added or taken away. And everything is, has a level of transparency that's a lot greater than what you could get in other uh, circumstances. And so thinking about who is creating the stable coin, what the mechanism is for creating the stable coin are all important questions to be asking. On this slide, I try to summarize a bunch of key concepts for when you're reviewing stable coins. Uh, we uh, have talked about a bunch of these. You know, is the coin fully backed and redeemable for some for the for whatever is underlying it? Dollars, for example, on a USD stable coin. 
um, or if it's collateralized by crypto assets, are you able to redeem your DAI for some of the collateral that you posted uh, to create the DAI in the first place? How does that work? How does that system work when there are fluctuations in the price of the underlying collateral, et cetera, et cetera? If the stable coin uh, um, relies on custody of the collateral, is that custody is on chain, as I said before, much easier to audit and see. If it's off chain, um, how do you know who the custodian is? What kinds of disclosures are being made about the custodian and by the custodian with respect to the collateral? Um, if a collateral includes physical assets, how are they tracked? Uh, so there's all kinds of different questions to be asked here. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot about with regard to the regulation of stable coins is, uh, should they be treated, should that regulation come in the form of bank regulation? This is one of the main questions from the President's Working Group report last fall. Um, I don't know that I have a definitive answer to that question. Uh, I think a lot of what drives that question is the similarities between some of these stable coins and bank accounts. Although, remember, we mentioned fractional reserve banking uh, earlier in the presentation. Under fractional reserve banking, what's really happening is I am depositing money at the bank. The bank then is keeping about 12 to 15% of that money in reserve and is lending out the rest of that money to other people. So most of my money is not sitting in the bank for me to grab whenever I need it. Most of my money is getting loaned out and the bank is doing complicated cash management to make sure that it has enough cash to meet its requirements. That cash management got more complicated as a result of the 2008 financial crisis and the Basel III requirements that came into effect as a result of it, but it's still basically a cash management problem. And so in thinking about what that regulation should look like, what the regulation of stablecoins should look like, because there are parallels to what happens in banking, um, I think some of the knee-jerk reaction is that uh, we, we should treat it the same as banking. And so the second to last bullet here is should it, it talks about the importance of taking a technology neutral approach to the regulation. So if something is uh, like another activity and we regulate that activity a particular way, then we should probably regulate all similar activities in the same way. Now, to some extent, we can say, well, there's a lot of things that go on that are look like similar activities, but the asset that is being traded or sold or created in connection with those activities is different. And the nature of that asset means that we treat the activities differently as a result. We can think about how heavy the regulation of the creation and trading of stocks and bonds is compared to the regulation of creating pet rocks or beanie babies or choose your other favorite toy or collectible. And so thinking about the uh, asset, thinking about the technology, thinking about all of these different factors is very important when it comes to thinking about the regulation. This slide talks about the considerations for central bank digital currencies that the Bank for International Settlements set out in October of 2020. What they tried to do was list out all of the different, uh, well, they tried to list out the main foundational principles for creating a central bank digital currency 
and then various features that make those principles work. And we have talked previously in the presentation about these principles and features. We've talked about them in a little bit uh, of a different way. These foundational principles of do no harm, make sure that there's coexistence with existing forms of money and technologies and promoting innovation and efficiency. All of those things are, are good principles on which a central bank digital currency can be built. And then the 14 features that they listed out to make those principles work, I think are really where the interesting part comes in. And you'll see a lot of these features have to do with the technology and how uh, current the technology is to make sure that we're able to achieve the kinds of throughput and interoperability and programmability, et cetera, et cetera, to meet the kinds of modern standards that we've come to expect as we all use technology. The Financial Stability Board, also in October of 2020, put out its list of recommendations for stable coins. Um, I've listed them here. One of the interesting things is if you replace stable coin with fiat currency here, um, you could say that these are also good principles to have for a fiat currency. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a disconnect, I think, part of which is driven by what we talked about before, the fact that stable coins are typically from private issuers, whereas uh, fiat currencies are issued by governments. But when we look outside of the major currencies and we see countries that have currencies where inflation rates greatly affect the value of the currency, the purchasing power associated with the currency, et cetera, et cetera. We sort of see how some of the requirements listed by the FSB here for stable coins might also be good ones to have for fiat currencies in, in certain jurisdictions. This slide just talks a little bit about some of the more cutting edge uh, pieces uh, of what could be happening with central bank digital currencies. Uh, as we talked about, the role of commercial banks is not that settled yet. Um, how much would be taken on by the central bank versus the commercial banks? Um, what kind of financial services infrastructure can be built on the foundations of the CBDC technology? How will monetary and fiscal policy be impacted by a central bank digital currency? What impacts will programmable money have for targeting and fine tuning the way that money is spent and what people can do with the money? By the way, there can be some nefarious things there too, right? If the government programs the money so that you can only use it for certain things um, that may not make it uh, a very desirable currency. It certainly makes it nothing like cash. And so thinking about these different elements and issues is I think very important. That's all I had for the presentation. I have a bunch of appendices that talk about countries that are um, that are engaged in this. Uh, I also have uh, a bunch of resources for central bank digital currencies and stable coins. Um, if, if, as I said, if folks are interested, um, by all means, we can, uh, we can share that with, uh, with everybody. We can share the presentation with everybody afterwards. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and Jim, happy to try to answer some questions. It looks like we've got a question in the chat already. Yeah, um, Tom asks, some stable coins are less transparent than what they, or some stable coins are less than transparent on what they're actually backed by. Do you have, does that 
seem to be a pretty you're shaking your head yes so i'll let you take it from there yeah no that's a that's a big issue and as i noted in the presentation um without naming any names there have been several of the large stable coins that uh, have come under scrutiny over the last several years to try to determine what is actually backing those those stable coins uh if anything at all um as i also said when you have a stable coin that is entirely on blockchain, then you have a much greater ability to audit the smart contract associated with it, to see the collateral that is backing the stable coin, um, and to see all of the exchanges between the collateral and the stable coin in connection with creations and cancellations of the stable coin. So lots of different questions to be answered and I think to some extent, this is what's driving some of the calls for banking regulation or banking like regulation for stablecoin issuers. For sure. Um, I have a kind of a question that kind of arose for me of listening to the presentation. Um, well, actually, I'll even frame it in the last discussion I kind of was having with Tom. We talked a little bit about the CBDCs, and I kind of mentioned, I, I kind of view CBDCs and cryptocurrencies as almost being in different lanes. I, I think they are easily tied together, but in some ways, they really almost um, are unethical to the opposite one. I mean, there are certain aspects of cryptocurrency, the decentralization, the desire for privacy, certain things like that as some of the CBDCs that have at least been envisioned or even the one in China that's been implemented, you know, decentralization is obviously not really in play at all. And, um, you know, its ability to be a private action is almost kind of, you know, runs against kind of what I believe or most believe the Chinese government is kind of trying to do with offering um, the digital you want. So could you talk a little bit about that, how they're coupled together, but potentially odd bedfellows, I guess? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. And I, I see somebody in the chat sort of asked a similar question uh, as well. So I'll try to answer try to answer both of the questions at the same time. Um, let, let me provide two different answers here. So one answer is as follows. When I originally started thinking about stable coins and central bank digital currencies, my assumption was that Central bank digital currencies, once they were introduced, would make stable coins obsolete. Nobody would ever want or need to use a stable coin ever again because the central bank digital currency would swamp the field and uh, become the means of payment on blockchain. I have since sort of walked back from that position because I uh, am a not confident that governments will introduce the requisite levels of programmability and interoperability and just sort of technological openness that are associated with stable coins sitting on a blockchain. Um, so I, I think we, I, I think the stable coin folks have a long uh, future ahead of them, regardless of whether or not CBDCs are introduced, because they are really playing two different two different roles. Um, the second answer that I'd give to the question is the following. Um, when people talk about cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, uh, those are two different uh, types of animals, or more precisely, cryptocurrencies are sort of a subset of crypto assets. We see all different types of crypto assets out there today. Think about it, when we started crypto assets, there was Bitcoin, and then there was Ether, and then people started creating other types of cryptocurrencies, but then people started creating crypto assets that had no relationship to currencies. So we look at, for example, lots of the NFTs that are out there, the Bored Apes, they don't look anything like a currency. The fart jars, they don't look anything like a currency. The Beeple artwork that sold for $69 million last year does not look anything like a currency. And so what we're seeing in the crypto asset realm is a huge diversity 
of use cases for crypto assets. Let me give another set of examples. When we look at a lot of the DAOs that are out there, they are run by a crypto asset that has voting capabilities, but is not really treated as a currency. Um, and so when we have all of this diversity of crypto assets, thinking about a central bank digital currency and how it fits in there is, as you pointed out, almost antithetical because a lot of these crypto assets are not trying to play currency-like roles, but rather are trying to play other roles in the different ecosystems where they are created. The last point I'll make is cryptocurrencies like Ether, like Bitcoin, like Avox on the Avalanche blockchain where, where I do most of my work, um, those cryptocurrencies have very specific roles in the layer one blockchains where they exist. They, those cryptocurrencies are integral to those blockchains um, and they help secure the network. They help incentivize various activities on the network, et cetera, et cetera. And so those currency like functions uh, I don't think go away just because you have a central bank digital currency. Uh, the central bank digital currency will not be a substitute for the cryptocurrencies that are an integral part of the networks that create them. Yeah, fair enough. Um, one question that's come in is, can stable coins be, uh, their backed collateral be devalued? And what's the impact to the CBDC? Um, do they kind of have a similar version of that? Yep. So um, there was a great tweet by Eric Voorhees, I think two days ago when the new inflation numbers came out in the US. Uh, his tweet was, all USD stable coins were just devalued by eight and a half percent, quoting the inflation rate. Right. And his point there was, you know, if you purport to be a USD stable coin, then the your purchasing power has decreased by eight and a half percent because of inflation. So central bank digital currencies, fiat currencies are going to be subject to the vagaries of inflation and other things that affect the value of a currency and the purchasing power of the currency. The same thing will happen with regard to um, the stable coins that are backed by other types of collateral as that as those other types of collateral gain and lose value then the um the the backing of those stable coins becomes more or less uh firm and so i do think there are some parallels there when you're looking at stable coins that are backed by crypto assets it depends very much on the crypto assets that are backing it. There's often a uh, great over collateralization for those types of stable coins because of the volatility and price fluctuations for the crypto assets that back them. But uh, definitely, definitely important things to think about both on the stable coin side and the CBDC side. So I, I mentioned briefly the Chinese digital yuan that they kind of, I guess you could say piloted during the Olympics. Um, do you have a sense for any kind of like takeaways that were, um, you know, learned or, you know, pros and cons that might've been exposed as they use the currency there? I, I just briefly looked at it. it. Seemed like they had a decent amount of transactions, like 9.7 billion transactions, according to Coindesk. Um, you know, that was back in November too. If they're keeping them going, it's a lot. But any kind of pros, cons, things learned during um, China's kind of a rollout of a first one for a major country? So not a central bank digital currency. I mean, it sort of is, but um, it's a very centralized central bank digital currency without a lot of transparency, without any privacy, without um, a lot of the design considerations that we discussed at the beginning of my presentation. So um, look, the I think the prevailing theory is that the Chinese government got nervous because 
the payment systems in China, particularly Tencent and WeChat Pay, um, were becoming so dominant in how people did transactions. Um, also, by the way, fairly centralized, so not great examples of decentralization, uh, that the Chinese government felt that they had to step in and, and introduce their own technology to take some of the power away from those companies. Um, so interesting experiment, not sure where it leads to. I don't think the digital yuan becomes sort of a widely used currency outside of China um, because of these limitations, certainly in the West, whatever that means. Um, I, I, I don't expect to see that. Uh, I don't expect to see it gain much traction. Um, last thing I'll say is lots of people think that it will gain traction as a result of the Belt and Road Initiative that China has, and China may force its debtor nations to use it. Um, so, you know, lots of different geopolitical considerations there, not just uh, central bank digital currency considerations. All right, good deal. Um, you know, one last question I think we'll throw out there. Um, let's step away from CBDC stablecoins for a half second. What's, what do you think excites you most about the broader scheme of blockchain or cryptocurrencies in the next year or so? What, what are you excited about? What are you seeing on the ground that, you, that you're interested by? Yeah, it's a great question. The thing that I'm most excited about is how much blockchain has grown and developed over the course of the last particularly five years. Um, you know, there's, there's now a real movement towards what people are calling Web3, whereas that was a lot of pie in the sky even up until, you know, a year or two ago. Um, with the amount of investment that's being made, with the number of companies that are active in the blockchain space, with the variety of problems that those companies are trying to solve, um, with the variety of products and services that they're trying to offer. I see Web3 as a real thing right now, and that's what really excites me the most. Great. Well, um, I did see one last follow-up coming here. Does currency fluctuation impact CBDCs and not cryptocurrencies? Hmm, I guess that's debatable, secondary effects. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question, and we definitely need some economists to be studying that question. Um, I'm just a just a dumb lawyer, so I don't I don't know that I would have a really good answer to that question. Um, there are a lot of people looking at how much of a linkage there is between the value of crypto assets and um, you know what's happening in the broader economy. Um, and so it definitely feels like um, it definitely feels like that's an area that people are looking at pretty hard right now. Yeah, definitely some academic research kind of going on here. We took a tangent in the certificate program this past week, kind of talking about similar to that question of you know is you know is it highly fluctuated with things like the Nasdaq index or is it actually a counterbalance? And you know the arguments kind of still are out those kinds of things that it will kind of time will tell but I, I think they like you said great minds and economists are kind of looking at that and I guess we'll see with time right on yep. well be very interesting to see what the answer is yeah for sure all right well with that you know I want to thank you very much for your time here today this is a great uh, session I really enjoyed it and we love having somebody come back to Blacksburg you're definitely the only um, twice here speaker so you know put that on the bio <laughs> Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Great to see everybody. All right. Wonderful. Have a great day. And uh, just uh, one quick plug to, um, though not on the original schedule, we do have um, a student session that's coming up that we're going to have a panel of students from Virginia Tech and from VCU talking a bit about uh, the work that they're doing in their um, clubs, talking a little bit about the future of blockchain and kind of where it's heading and definitely uh, should be a great session. So stick around for that. We're going to start off about one o'clock for that. So um, yeah, see you soon.